Psychonauts is a game that focuses on exploring the minds of the characters. By diving directly into their mindscape, we can visualize their psyche. In this way, their history, way of thinking, and traumas are laid bare. But not all characters in the game have mental worlds to visit. Including Raz and Lily, there are a total of 21 kids who attend Whispering Rock Psychic Summer Camp. Despite having their own stories, none of them, with the exception of Raz, has a mental world that we visit. As such, the usual tactics for trying to understand them will not work here. To get to the bottom of their characters, we will have to take off the training wheels that the mental worlds gave us and do this the old-fashioned way. By observing their personalities, their dialogue, how they behave around others, and who they surround themselves with. Throughout the game, we see them interact and go about their daily lives, briefly crossing paths with the main plot. However, there is a lot of additional story not found in the game. Back at the inception of social media platforms, the developers at Double Fine created profile pages on Friendster and MySpace for all the campers. On it, details that weren't in the game were revealed. Some of these were as simple as favorite movies or books, while others gave full backstories. This video will be structured by taking both in-game details and the campers' social media profiles as evidence. So let's get into it. It seems fitting that we start with Raz's best friend at camp, Dogen Bool. Given what we know about his grandfather, it is no surprise that Dogen is unable to control his psychic powers. As a result, he is forced to wear a tinfoil hat to protect those around him from blowing up. Personality-wise, he has difficulty fully understanding what people tell him and is rather innocent. Before going to camp, he is told by his family that all the others would be wearing hats to keep their powers in check as well. As a result, he takes a huge interest in the headgear worn by the other campers. It is possible that the root of his awkwardness is as a result of his poor social development. This would stem from Dogen being insulated from others growing up. Because of his habit of causing people's heads to explode, it is reasonable to assume that the Bool family kept him away from other children of his age. This may have stunted his ability to properly communicate and socialize. Moving forward, the other campers have group narratives, so we will discuss them together and how they relate. The first story group involves JT, Chops, Elka, and Nils. Let's do a brief look at each before detailing their shared storyline. JT Hoofberger outwardly portrays the image of a cowboy. However, he has a trait that is more relevant to his characterization. In his About Me section of the social media platform, he expresses that he don't talk much when I ain't got nothing to say. JT has a tendency to stay silent and keep his thoughts to himself, especially when speaking his mind would lead to conflict. The trouble with this is as a result of not speaking up, bad situations can get worse because he does not take action. Melvin Sweetwind aka Chops is Canadian and JT's best friend. He has a similar disposition where he acknowledges he's good at psychic boxing, but does not want to be in a fight. Once more we see a capable individual who does not go looking for conflict. Nils Lutfisk comes from California and is 9 years old. At one point, he tells Raz he is much more mature, because his parents allow him to watch R-rated movies. Pretty much every time we see him, Nils is hitting on one of the female campers. With the limited information we have, it appears that he was exposed to adult behavior far too young and began to emulate the behavior he saw. Monkey see, monkey do. Children are perceptive, they observe their parents' behavior and consume media to determine what is normal behavior. What they learn can have either positive or negative impacts with their personal development. Elka Doom is weirdly enough the most developed camper at Whispering Rock. Her family comes from a long line of soothsayers who are always accurate with their predictions, but could only predict misfortune. Hence the surname Doom. The family line descended from an individual called Old Man Doom. He predicted the death of cattle, murder, even the town's grain harvest being lost. One day, the townspeople decided he was responsible for their misfortune and formed a mob with torches. To avoid what would have come next, Old Man Doom claimed to have foreseen a prosperous, wonderful year for everybody. With this situation diffused, the town people who came together left down the mountain. On the way down, his true fortune came true, and an avalanche killed every one of them. The remaining townspeople banished him as a result. The history continued through the generations, some of the Dooms being hired to advise rulers or hired as an insurance actuary since they knew any troubles that would befall the policyholders in advance. 
Elga had the same gift and was sent away to Whispering Rock by her father and stepmother after she predicted one of them would have an affair that summer. The moment Elka arrived, she knew something terrible would happen. The base narrative for these characters involves Elka and Nils breaking up. This situation confused Elka since she had seen a future where her and Nils were together. In order to curse the fates, so to speak, she took advantage of the breakup and decided to prevent this future from coming true. She initiated a relationship with JT. This drives a wedge between him and Chops. Elka goes out of her way to show off this relationship, publicly posting on social media and telling anyone who would listen. In a way, she was attempting to convince herself as much as everyone else. During this time, Nils was hitting up every girl at camp, not really caring who he spent time with as long as he wasn't alone. Despite seeing this behavior and being frustrated by it, Elka never stopped wanting Nils back. His campster profile only has comments from her. The post jumps back and forth between her hating him and obsessing over him. She even goes so far as to write a letter to his mother and place it under his pillow to send for her, most likely hoping he will read it and know her thoughts. As the saying goes, she protested too much. Despite this, JT was not really thrilled with dating Elka. In Mia's dance party, he invites Raz to dance with her instead, almost trying to push her off on anyone else. He comments on Chops' campster profile that he finds her dull and is frustrated with her taking up all of his time. For a while, he was pretending to have joined Phoebe and Quentin in their band just to spend time away from her. Due to his reserved nature, he does not say anything to her directly and keeps going along with the relationship. This creates friction between all three involved, leading to a confrontation between Chops and Elka. I don't care how long you two have been partners. James is my boyfriend now. Do you know what that means? Uh, well, he wears his good parade chaps a lot more. Yes, he's less filthy, that's part of it. But the biggest change is that he can't possibly waste as much time as he used to hanging out with his loser friends. I don't like you. And I don't like you. So that covers everything we have in common. Now for the differences. I'm going to be with James all the time from now on. You're going to have to stay as far away from us as possible, or I'm going to make your life more miserable than I imagine it already is. Throughout this, JT did nothing to convey his true thoughts on the matter, not wanting to cause strife with Elka. But by avoiding one battle, he caused the strife to escalate for all three of them. Huh? Oh, sorry, Raz. I'm a little preoccupied right now. Got a lot of figuring to do. Luckily, the situation settled itself out. After their stolen brains were returned, Elka's first thought was to find Nils and make up. JT and Chop spent their time together and patrolled the campgrounds, keeping the others safe. Before getting back to another of the big character groups, let's talk about one of the standalone campers, Vernon Tripe. We first meet him telling a very long story about walking his dog that doesn't make a lot of sense. Vernon considers himself a storyteller, but his communication skills and how he presents these stories are horrible. Mostly, he focuses on insignificant details to the point where everyone tunes out. As a result, most of the campers avoid his sessions. His campster page has zero comments since everyone actively avoids him. Crafting stories in his head, Vernon sometimes loses touch with reality. He imagines a secret relationship with Frankie. His About Me section details an ancient caveman named Thog, who was the storyteller of his time since there was no TV. According to his fantasy, Thog passed the skill of the bard down through the generations to him. Quentin Hedgemouse is a central figure that connects three separate character circles, so let's introduce him before branching out. For starters, he is the only other camper besides Lily who picked up on Lobato and Oleander before it happened. He told his bandmate Phoebe he had been having dreams about a bathtub, an obvious connection to the mad dentist. Other than that, there's not much to say about him. He is charismatic, friendly, funny, and has a camp band with Phoebe. All around, he is the universally popular guy in the group. This causes him to be the target of female attention. One of which is Milka Phage, a shy girl that has a habit of turning invisible when she wants to leave a situation. Ever since she was a kid, she practiced turning invisible at her mother's request. Milka's father was no longer in the picture, and she told her daughter that looking at her reminded her of him. As a result, Milka got so talented she could remain invisible in her own home for three days straight. Her one friend was a cat who could see her even when invisible. 
Because of this, she was trained that others did not want to see her. It became a habit to simply vanish when things got stressful. On her first day at camp, rather than meet with the other kids, she ran out into the woods for days and lived off bugs rather than be around people. From afar, she watched others and learned about them. Eventually, she developed a crush on Quentin. She would hang out in the mess hall, listen to them practice, but vanish if anyone got too close. However, with no pun intended, she was invisible to him. His eyes were on someone else, which we'll discuss later. One day in the cafeteria, Milka had a seizure and began speaking Latin. She was no stranger to these episodes, and during this one, she had a vision which caused her to redirect her affections from Quentin to another camper, Elton. Elton Fur is also a shy and timid individual. His father was a sailor who died at sea. As a result, the boy developed hydrophobia and was always wearing a sailor hat in order to remember him by. Elton was raised by his mother in what he thought was a big hotel for ladies that Navy men would frequent. Based upon context, he grew up in a brothel and his mother was an escort. Elton's father was likely a frequent customer whenever the ship was in dock. Moving past this backstory, Elton could hear the thoughts of fish and would spend his time listening to them. He was the first to learn about Linda from the fish, but didn't realize what they were so scared about. For most of the story, he had a crush on Lily, but his attempts to attract her attention were mostly ignored. In this way, he and Milka were essentially in the same boat, interested in someone who did not notice them. On that pier, Elton heard that Bobby and Benny were abusing some fish. While invisible, Milka pulled one of them out of the water to scare the bullies. This event caused Elton to notice her finally, and the two became a couple and spent most of their time together from there on forward. Their camp story is one of being so fixated on one thing that they do not notice something better is right around the corner. Luckily, it worked out for these two. Let's go back to Quentin. The reason he was clueless of Milga's interest is because he was solely focused on Kitty Bubai. She is the queen bee of the camp, always needing to be the center of tension, teasing others, leading on some boys so they will do her homework, and setting them up for embarrassment simply for her own amusement. At the end of the day, she has a compulsive need for attention. Like a peacock or a butterfly, she throws up an image for others to gravitate towards. Of course, anyone who either doesn't fall for it or challenges her image becomes the target of her bullying. Raz lands himself on this list. Where'd you get your clothes? Because my sister? She's kind of fat and she has so much trouble finding good stuff. What? Her campster page includes a full list and excessive detail of every makeup product she uses. More importantly, it lets us know her father was in the Navy and she moved around a lot. Based upon some research discussing children who are forced to move too much, there are a host of problems that comes along with it. Kitty was unable to form any real relationships with those her age. The moment she would start a friendship, she was pulled away. As a result, she never developed close emotional bonds. She compensated by becoming manipulative and forcing attention onto herself. Her psychic powers helped as we see with Quentin. If we look at her character model, her eyes form a spiral. Based upon some dialogue during his band practice, it is hinted that she has the power to hypnotize people. Kitty Booba. Yeah. I mean, she's cool and all, but I didn't think that was your type. Well, I mean, I guess I feel you on that one. But I can't explain it. It's like she has some sort of spell over me. Uh-oh. <laughs> if this is true, then Kitty literally bewitched him to be interested in her. Her profile on Campster tells us her favorite book is How to Make Friends and Influence People. She is so desperate to form relationships that she psychically manipulates people to fulfill that need. Frankie Athens is a follower of Kitty for different reasons. When listening to their dialogue, she tends to mimic Kitty's quips and behaviors. Hey look, I got a button. Can I join your little craft club? Hey look, I got an ugly face. Can I join your ugly club? Uh, Frankie, let me handle the insults, okay? Any characterization she gets is in relation to her friend. That's the point. Frankie has next to no identity, and manufactures one to imitate others she sees as popular. In terms of character archetype, Frankie is an eternal follower that feels like nothing when she's alone. With the first two out of the way, let's look at the most platonic relationship Quentin has, that is with Phoebe Love. She is a drummer that jams out with Quentin. Despite their bickering, they work very well together. Phoebe suffers from an unconscious compulsion to set things on fire. 
While she attempts to suppress this pyromania, sometimes it leaks out. During a drum solo, she accidentally lit them on fire after getting too excited. Her efforts to control this compulsion leads to phobias such as being frightened of lighters. According to her, she has a mental block about setting Quentin on fire, which is why she spends time with him. He is safe to be around. Phoebe's other defining trait is her compassion for everyone she comes into contact with. Her desire is to become a psychic therapist. We see her reach out on nearly everyone's social media. Phoebe gives them mental health advice and invites them to talk to her about their problems. It is normal for those who have their own emotional or psychological problems to be interested in others. For one, diving into another person's mind means they do not have to spend time with their own. But in Phoebe's case, she understands the nature of her problem. Feeling like she managed to get a handle on her own compulsions, she can redirect that energy to help others who may not yet understand the nature of theirs. While she does work to try to help nearly everyone at camp, two specific individuals that need it the most are Clemfoot and Crystal Snogrash. These two are joined at the hip and can be considered nearly identical in characterization, so we will discuss them together. They consider themselves cheerleaders and obnoxiously root for everyone, even if they are doing the most basic of things. This, however, is a facade. Both are suffering from an existential crisis and severe depression. Remembering back to Mia, this is an example of smiling depression at work. When Raz bumps into them at the top of a radio tower, they are upbeat until Crystal messes up a cheer and breaks down into tears. Clem comforts her and tells Raz to leave. After this, they pull out a bottle with a symbol for poison on it. At one point, Milka had been following the two while invisible and saw them stealing drain fluid from the janitor's closet. Later, the two can be found on the roof of the main lodge, discussing what they call the project. The sunset's beautiful, isn't it? It will be more beautiful afterwards. When we've done what we're going to do. Yes, when we've finished the project. The people down there look like ants, don't they? They are ants, Crystal. Cruel, cruel little ants. Oh, Clem, it's not their fault. Still, they're gonna be sorry. Yes, that's true. They will all be sorry. This project for them is the intention to end their lives. On the campster profiles, they will occasionally abandon their cheerful comments to go on a pessimistic rant about the meaninglessness of life, even subtly trying to ask the others if they would notice or even care if they were gone. Let's let people have one last sunset before things change forever. Forever. Clem is worse in his worldview, likely due to his father's abuse. He was told consistently how useless he was and how he was a total idiot at most things. For children, when they hear something over and over from a trusted parental figure, they may begin to accept it as truth. Crystal may have her own issues, but it appears that Clem's self-destructive influence may have worsened her own thinking. Those in a fragile state of mind can be receptive to outside influences. What was once bad is now worse. Luckily, after they were rebrained, they have a new outlook on life. They decided that in dark times, people needed cheer more than ever. So they devoted themselves to making the residents of Whispering Rock more cheerful. The final character circle involves one of the most common growing up scenarios, bullies and victims. Starting off, we have Bobby Zilch, the typical camp bully who threatens the others for arrowheads, bullies them, and beats them up. There are only two chinks in his armor that we see in the story. One is at the end of the game when Ford mentions Raz's father. At this point, Bobby becomes momentarily emotional. Most likely, he has a bad relationship with his father. This is common in bully psychology. One reason for this behavior is because some form of abuse at home that caused the child to feel helpless. There are two primary reactions to this. One, to roll over and become an eternal victim. Or two, to take back a sense of control by bullying others. Since they have no control at home, they will find it elsewhere. The other crack is Chloe Barge. Before getting into her relationship with Bobby, let's look at her individually. The biggest piece of her characterization is the fact that she believes she's an alien and is constantly trying to contact her home planet to come to rescue her. Ever since she could remember, Chloe heard voices in her head due to her psychic abilities. This made her feel like she didn't belong since no one else understood what she was going through. With no way of knowing where they were coming from, she came to believe they were signals being sent by an alien family. 
As time went on, she sought to get their attention and leave behind this rock we call Earth. By the time she got to camp, Bobby had developed a crush on her. Because of this, Chloe can get him to stop his aggressive actions. On one occasion, he drove away Nils by insulting him when he caught him hitting on Chloe. Bobby was reprimanded by her after this. Multiple times in the campster comment section, she puts her foot down with him and he immediately ceases his actions. During these times, he snaps at his number two in command, Benny, forcing him to stop as well. This confuses the boys since he has emulated Bobby's example since they met at camp. Benny Fidelio has a similar bully mentality, but it is fueled by a different source. Benny is a coward, always fearful and knows he cannot do anything for himself. In basic braining, he begins screaming how frightened he is without Bobby there to protect him. Bobby, can you hear me? Where are you? Don't leave me alone out here, Bobby. I'm frightened! I'm frightened! In order to deal with his constant fear and insecurity, he found the biggest and meanest guy at camp and latched onto him. This way he would always have someone to protect him. Benny was always a doormat though. He would do self-depreciating tasks for the sole purpose of keeping Bobby happy. There was no loyalty, however. The moment that Benny got his brain back and learned that Coach Oleander set in motion a plan to take over the world, he considered switching teams to work with the coach. Since Bobby was no longer the big bad of the camp, he would abandon him to join the new big bad. Unable to get by on his own, he is a leech to whatever muscle he could find. The only person at camp that can put these two in their place is the true strong man of the campers, Mikhail Bulgakov. Mikhail is a pretty one-note character. He enjoys wrestling and fighting in general. On pretty much everyone's social media page, he wargames how his strategy would go if the two of them fought. From what we see, he has a plan to take on everyone with the exception of Dogen. He plans to forfeit this fight since the tinfoil hat could fall off too easily leading to exploding heads. With a single-minded focus, he finds Maloof being bullied in the parking lot by Bobby and Benny. This confrontation concluded with Mikhail driving the two off and then forming a deal with Maloof. He protects Maloof and, as a reward, is allowed to fight anyone. In a sense, he is a dog who has been given permission to be let off the leash as long as he only attacks when the small boy gives permission. Maloof Canola has probably the greatest character transformation out of all of the campers. During this scene in the parking lot, Bobby had strapped a dead fish to Maloof's head using a pair of underwear. Earlier, I mentioned that one reaction to abuse is to roll over and become a permanent victim. That is Maloof in a nutshell, always the target of bullying and doing nothing to stand up for himself, simply sitting back and accepting it. This is a decent example of what we talked about with Fred Bonaparte and learned helplessness. However, once Mikhail appeared to defend him, he saw an opportunity. Enlisting the mindless battle fiend, he worked to usher in a new age at the camp. His social media shows that he is a huge fan of mafia films, and that is exactly what he starts. He begins soliciting protection money from the other campers, saying that the two of them would protect the others from Bobby and Benny. Seeing talent in them, he sought to enlist them as well. In a matter of speaking, Maloof transformed from a meek child to the mafia boss of Whispering Rock. This is yet another response that some get when gaining power. Those who have spent so much of their time without it tend to abuse it once they are top dog. While we don't see him doing anything to the other campers, Raz encounters Maloof and Mikael torturing Benny in the wilderness, commenting on ways to literally kill him while asking what he has to offer them. On such tiny opponent, all blood might drain out ear holes. Shut up, Benny! On the other hand, blood from constricted trunk could rush to tongue. And? Tongue swells, pops, most blood drains back down throat. Interesting. Less mess that way. Mouth stuffed with giant tongue can't scream. So quiet. Ah. It is almost frightening how radically different he is from the start of the game to the end. After being rebrained, the two can be found down at the parking lot, rigging Oleander's jeep with explosives. Hey, want to help me save the world? We are! This is how we handle things in my family! We empathize with him because we see him at his weakest and most vulnerable. But that does not mean his abuse of power is any more moral than the original bullies. When the resentful victim gains power, sometimes they become the new bully. With this, I hope everyone has a better understanding of the Whispering Rock campers. Everything here is based upon my interpretation of their characterizations. I'm curious if anyone has different perspectives. 
Since we cannot dive into their heads, it is much more difficult to get a read on them. But again, that's the point. In real life, we don't have the benefit of cheating with a psi portal. The people we meet in our lives can only be truly understood by paying attention to their words and their actions. I wanted to thank everyone for supporting this series. This video officially concludes Season 1 of The Psychology of Psychonauts. Season 2 will begin shortly at the bottom of the ocean. Thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed, please drop a like as it really does help out the channel. If you would like updates on new uploads, feel free to subscribe or follow me on Twitter. Have a good day and peace be with you all.